Welcome to Christ Commission Fellowship in San Francisco. My name is Bev Concepcion. Good morning. If this is your first time tuning in, we would like to give you a special welcome. You could have picked any church's live stream, but you chose us and we thank you for that. This online service is available on demand at our YouTube channel and Facebook page. We praise God for the recently concluded week-long Intentional Discipleship Conference with the theme, Discipleship in the New Normal. Let's watch the recap. Welcome to our Intentional Discipleship Conference 2021. This is the first time we will do it worldwide online. When we go through difficult times in our lives, we should still show the world how different we are by our love for others, our hope in Christ, and our thankful hearts, regardless of the circumstances. You see, what gives value to your faith is the object. It's not a great faith in God that moves mountains. It's faith in a great God that moves mountains. We are so amazed as thousands of families and small groups gathered together online to be equipped on how to disciple and share the truth in this new normal world. We thank God for this IDC because you keep on reminding us that discipleship is really a worthwhile ministry, especially during this time of pandemic. I thank God for allowing IDC to go online because many members and their families were able to attend here in the U.S. and learn uh, new ways to disciple in the new normal. Praise God indeed. Even when we're in the wilderness and we feel lost and we're not sure even where we're going, that it is possible in the midst of suffering to take a moment to express joy and thanksgiving to God. And as we do, He draws close to us, we draw close to Him. We encounter Him in a way that brings fulfillment, purpose, meaning. And as you hold on to Him, committed to Him, even though things are getting from bad to worse and you won't let Him go, until you feel you can't hold on to Him anymore, that's when you realize it's not you who has been holding to Him all the time. It's been Him who's been holding to you all the time. It's not your strength that has kept you. It is His strength that has kept you. Only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last. You only have one life. I pray that you invest your life in something that will outlast you. I encourage you to focus on God's vision for you to make disciples. If you've missed some of the topics or if you want to get a copy of the sessions, please refer to the links posted on the screen. You know, like Jesus' first disciples, Walking with Him day by day is the most exciting journey you will ever take. Let's watch and listen as Senior Pastor Peter Tanchi gives us a brief introduction and welcome Dr. Philip Lin of Skyline Sid Church in Malaysia as he delivers today's message. At the end of the message, we will celebrate the Lord's table. Have your elements ready. So, let's begin our worship by lifting him up with our songs of praise. Good morning, church, and welcome again to CCI. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Let's all sing about that. This Jesus that carried our shame, this Jesus who rose from the grave, the same Jesus we worship today. We worship today Came to us With grace and in truth Still with us 
and still love them move the same Jesus. He's making us new, is making us new. And I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. He's still keeping all his promises. The same Jesus, the same Jesus. He's coming again, He's coming again. And I know that my Redeemer lives. And I know that my Redeemer lives. Yeah, He's keeping all His promises. The same Jesus, the same Jesus. First and the last, the beginning and end, at the sound of his cry, all the world came alive, and he formed us from dust, put his breath in our lungs, we were made for his love, but we ran in the light, but he wouldn't give up, and his daughters and sons, so we took up the cross, and he laid down his life, and he did what he said. When he rose from the dead and is coming back again. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. He's still keeping all his promises. The same Jesus, the same Jesus. and shake and crumble At your name The oceans roar and tumble At your name Angels bow down The earth will rejoice Your people cry out
there is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. No one like our God, we will sing, we will sing. There's no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. No one like our God, we will sing, we will sing. There's no one like our God. This Sunday, I am privileged to introduce to you our guest speaker. He is none other than Dr. Philip Lin. Philip Lin has been a friend. He has invited me to his church. But what impressed me about Philip Lin is their emphasis on the actual practice of Christianity in the marketplace. You see, Philip Lin is a full-time doctor. At the same time, he's a full-time pastor. His elders, his other pastors, they are lawyers, they are bankers. Why? Because Philip Lane's philosophy is so biblical. It's about we are servants of the Lord. No matter what we do, we are to serve God. We are to give Him our talents, our treasures. So I'm so glad that this Sunday, Philip Lynn can share with us his inspiration from God. I pray you'll be blessed. Lord Jesus, we come before you, acknowledging you. You're our Lord, our God. What a privilege it is to worship you today. I pray that you will give all of us a humble heart. Lord, help us to listen to what you will tell us. And not just to listen to your word, but to apply your word in our lives. We now commit to you, Dr. Philip Lin. You seem mightily. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Let's welcome Dr. Philip Lin. Hello, Pastor Peter, dear Tanchi, and the amazing family at CCF. Uh, I count it a huge privilege to address you all today. Uh, I bring you greetings all the way from Skyline Church in Malaysia. Malaysia, Philippines, we're not that far apart. Uh, both Pastor Peter and Pastor Diona have been great blessings to us over the years. We love and appreciate you and your friendship, Peter and Diona and your family, and this wonderful extended big family called CCF all over the world. This morning, I'd like to share with you something that I believe should be part and parcel of our discipleship walk. So as we come to the end of IDC 2021, I believe that this is going to be a supernatural year for us uh, in the new normal discipleship. I want us to believe that God will break through even as we reach out with the gospel and fulfill the gospel mandate and share the gospel and bring an, a people to, into the kingdom of God and make disciples of the nations. Today, I want to speak about miracles, experiencing the supernatural in our discipleship journey. And I know that sometimes this is not very much spoken about, but I do believe it is a natural part of us because we worship and follow a supernatural God. And He is the way maker. He is the miracle worker. He is the light in our darkness. Somebody say an amen to that. Many people today reject miracles and the supernatural simply because they contravene natural laws. You see, a miracle by definition is an extraordinary event with a positive outcome that is not explicable by natural or scientific laws. And therefore, we attribute it to God. Many people say, well, because it actually breaks scientific laws, uh, we, we don't believe it. That's the attitude and the approach of the postmodern 21st century world. 
But for us, miracle is extraordinary uh, event with a positive outcome that's not explicable by scientific laws, but we know God breaks in. It is in fact a paradox with a divine cause. What is a paradox? A paradox is when you have two conflicting truths and they both coexist. For example, in this picture, I have two buttons, a red button as well as a blue button. Uh, the red button says the blue button is true. Then the blue button says the red button is false, which contradicts the red button. So if that is the case, then what the blue button is saying uh, cannot be true as well. So you either have only one of the two buttons existing, one truth, or neither of them existing. But if both of them exist and they claim to be the truth, you have a contradiction. And if they both exist, you have a paradox. Now, many people say they don't believe in miracles because it contravenes the laws of nature. But science itself is full of paradoxes. For example, space-time is a paradox. We experience space as three-dimensional with a flow of time. That's how we experience it. But actually, Albert Einstein showed us that space and time is warped together as a fabric. It's all one. It's actually we live in a four-dimensional realm. Light is a paradox. Sometimes it behaves like a wave, sometimes like a particle. Which is it? We don't know. It's, it's a paradox. It's both. How can it be both at the same time? Well, it is both. It's a paradox. Quantum mechanics or physics is actually a paradox. It's undergirded by the uncertainty principle, which says that at subatomic level, if you can determine the position of a subatomic particle, you can't determine its momentum and vice versa. If you can determine its momentum, you can't determine its position. That means at the subatomic level in quantum physics, which undergirds all our physics, everything is uncertain. It's called the uncertainty principle. Matter is a paradox. All the matter that we can see around us, galaxies as well as on planet Earth, everything only constitutes 4% of all the matter in the universe. The bulk of the matter in the universe is made up of 75% dark energy, which causes the accelerated expansion of the universe, and 21% dark matter, which causes the galaxies to rotate round in a way that is more than it should if there was only uh, just normal matter. So what is dark energy? What is dark matter? We don't know. What is it made up of? Where did it come from? We don't know. Matter is a paradox. So at the basis of science itself, it is made up of paradoxes. Just in case you think all these are just flights of fantasies and imagination, the people who discovered this won Nobel Prizes. Einstein won the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect of light. Werner Heisenberg won it for the uncertainty principle. And recently, three physicists, ast astrophysicists, uh, Adam Rees and Saul Perlmutter of the United States and Brian Schmidt of Australia won it in 2011 for the discovery of dark energy. When you go to the Bible, there you go. It's full of paradoxes, just like it is in science. God is three, yet one. How can it be? That's a paradox. Jesus was both man and God. That's a paradox. The Bible was written by man, but divinely inspired by God. Those are paradoxes. I want to tell you this, that one of the great uh, truths in which our lives are, are founded on is that God can break through some of the laws of nature where miracles take place in our lives. When I first became a Christian for many years, I did not believe very much in miracles. I thought God was a pie in the sky when we die and, you know, and the by and by. Until um, several years after I became a Christian, I, when I was studying medicine in, in the UK, I went on a summer crusade with Operation Mobilization one summer to share the gospel in Italy. We were there for about six weeks. And uh, after the six weeks was over, we saw many miracles, but those were minor miracles. But the big one I would tell you about was when we were uh, making our way back over Italy into Austria and eventually to get back to Belgium so that we could take a ferry back to England. We were all together in a bread van, 20 students. And uh, when we were up on the mountains, crossing northern Italy into Austria, I saw the brakes fail. In other words, the driver stepped on the pedal, the brakes, the brakes failed to engage, and uh, he managed to change his gear down and pull the vehicle to the side of the road using a handbrake. And we stopped there, you know, barely thankful to the Lord for saving our lives at a point in time. So we, we look at the engine. I went with the driver down to look at the engine and I found that there was fluid, brake fluid leaking from the brake compartment. And that's why there was no resistance in the brake pedal when it was stepped on. 
And I said to the leader of the group, I said, she was a tall Swedish guy. I said, we need a mechanic. But it was one o'clock in the morning up on the mountains. Where are we going to get a mechanic? He said, let's pray. I thought that was a stupid thing. But I prayed anyway together with them because I didn't have much faith in those days. And so we prayed. At the end of one hour, he said, I believe God has done a miracle. Why don't you check the brakes? And then I saw it with my own eyes. I saw the driver of the vehicle step on the brake pedal and now the brake met resistance. We were so excited. I, we, we lifted up the bonnet of the, the van to have a look at the engine. Somewhere and somehow, God had sealed the, lake, uh, the, the, the leak in the brake fluid compartment and had created some dark fluid. I assume it's brake fluid that's in there. And we were able to, to restart the, the, the van and drive all the way back down to Austria and eventually back to Belgium. And I caught my ferry back into the UK. That incident, that incident, that personal story of Operation Mobilization changed my attitude from apathy. I was apathetic about miracles to all. God can intervene in our lives. I remember another story told to me by a, a Church of England clergyman. He was quite a bright guy, you know, very rational, very logical, but he believed in Jesus, but he didn't very much believe in miracles. One day he went to a Catherine Kuhlman rally, a healing evangelist rally in the United States. He planted himself in the front seat to get a full view because he was cynical about healings. And during the service, Catherine Kuhlman said, there's a man in the front who's being healed and, and asked that man to come uh, forward uh, because that man uh, was being healed of his limp and his bad leg. And this man came up and said he was, it was him. And Catherine Kuhlman said, you couldn't walk before? The man said, no, I couldn't walk before. Then can you walk now? And he walked perfectly and said, can you run? So he ran perfectly and the whole stadium erupted into cheers and applause. Now the Church of England clergyman, he was, that, that minister was sitting there with his arms folded. He was not impressed. He turned to the old man sitting next to him and said, you know that guy who went up two seats from us, who went up there, who's now walking on the platform? Obviously it's a plant, isn't it? Somebody planted him there. He probably had nothing wrong with him, but he just came out just to pretend that he had been healed so that faith would arise in the auditorium and the giving towards this ministry would increase. Uh, and he said, that, you don't truly believe that, do you? He told the old man. And then he saw tears streaming down the eyes from the old man. And the old man turned and looked at him and says, that was a miracle because that man who went up was my son. He couldn't walk before. And that struck the, that, that clergyman. From that moment, his cynicism turned to conviction. Today, I want to take you on a journey with me so that in this year, 2021, as we enter into new disciple, uh, new normal discipleship, I believe that many of us are going to see the miracles of God for our lives. Can somebody say an amen to that? Miracles are going to break through for your life. So I want to talk about the first miracle Jesus did. John chapter 2, the first miracle, the wedding at Cana of Galilee, where Jesus converted water into wine. Let's read it together, starting from verse 1. And there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six jars of stone, each containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And he said to them, draw out some now and take it to the master of the feast. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he called the bridegroom and said, every man starts with a good wine and then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This was the first of the miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and his disciples believed him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. Let's start with the background. Whose wedding feast was it at Cana? Probably one of Mary's close relatives. Why? Because when they ran out of wine, they went to Mary first. And you must understand that running out of wine in a Middle Eastern wedding is like running out of food in a Chinese wedding. It is a shameful thing and people will talk about it in shameful turn for generations. So when you run out of wine, you obviously don't go and tell the guests. Just like in a Chinese wedding, if you run out of food, you never go and tell the guests first. You tell somebody in the family first. So they went and told Mary first. So she must be a family member. Not only that, you know, they knew, the servants not only knew who she was, but they knew that she had authority in the family. Otherwise, why go and see her? 
because probably the rest of the family were busy, but she had authority in the family. She was probably the aunt, and probably her nephew or niece was getting married, and she was probably a regular visitor. She was probably the, the, the oldest aunt, and so she had authority over the servants. That's why they went to her first. And here's the second reason why it was a family wedding uh, of the relatives of Mary, because ultimately, Mary brought the whole family there. Mary brought Jesus and all the brothers there. Now, you normally don't bring your family to a friend's wedding. At least, it's not done uh, in Asia. I, I don't think it's done anywhere in the world. You don't bring your friends to, uh, you know, you don't, don't bring your family to a friend's wedding. You only bring your family when it's a relative's wedding, okay? Your cousins, or your uncles, your aunties, an extended family uh, relative's wedding. So the whole family was there. So it had to be one of Mary's family's relative's wedding. Now, I would like to establish four keys, four keys by which we as disciples of the Lord begin to experience the miraculous in our journey uh, as disciples. Here's the first thing. The four keys to experiencing miracles comes firstly to looking to Jesus first. When you meet a situation that's challenging, when you need a situation where you need a breakthrough, look to Jesus first. It says in verse 3, when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now, the normal thing to do, the natural thing to do when you run out of wine in a Middle Eastern wedding is run hither, thither, go to the village, look for people and say, hey, anybody can, can lend me some bottles of wine, half a barrel of wine, you know, a few jugs of wine. Is there a wine merchant in town that we can buy wine from? Is there somebody with a big wine cellar that we can borrow wine from? That's the natural. That's looking at a natural. They would go and do that. Just like many of us, you know, when we face challenges, um, supposing we have challenges in our business, we'll start going to the bank manager looking for a friendly bank, an extra loan first, people who loan us money because, you know, we have cash flow problems. Or when we come up from a doctor's office with bad diagnosis, is there any other specialist that we can look at? Any other doctor from whom we can get a second opinion? Any expert in a medical field we can get a second opinion? We would think like that first naturally. But if you want to see the miracle, we don't think like that first. Look to Jesus first. Look with your heart. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. She didn't look for the, to borrow wine. She didn't look for people with wine sellers or wine merchants. She went straight to the Son of God. She looked to Jesus first. And that's the first thing we should understand in our discipleship journey. Hey guys, every time we face challenges in our lives, whatever it may be you are going through right now, look to Jesus first. Look with your heart. Secondly, look beyond God's apparent non-response. Sometimes when we look, we don't get an immediate reply from God. Sometimes we get a lot of other distractions and we wonder if God is even there. You know, you may have a, a bad back and you know, you can hardly walk and you're struggling to get into your car and you're crying out to God to heal you. Nothing seems to be happening. You get into your car, you shut the car door, you turn on the ignition and it wouldn't start because the battery is flat. What do you do? It's like another problem on top of this problem that you have. Is God there? God's apparent non-response. You see, when Mary went to Jesus, Jesus and said to him, we have no wine. She expected Jesus to actually say yes or no to her. Jesus, in fact, said neither. He said, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. What? What kind of response is that? It's an apparent non-response. It's not yes, it's not no, it's just a non-response. Sometimes when you're sitting in that car and you had a bad back, you're crying out to God for healing and your car won't start. Is God there? Is, has he, is he going to heal you or not? It's not a yes, it's not a no, it's a non-response. But God is in the non-response. You come out of a doctor's office with a bad diagnosis and you're crying out to God for healing and suddenly, you know, some, the kids are playing on the streets and they, 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 kick you, they kick the ball and it hits your face and the ball lands up on the tree and they ask you if you can take the ball down for them. What has this to do with your bad diagnosis? You're asking God to heal you. Is God here in the midst of this? You're, you're, you're taking balls down from the tree for the kids and uh, your mind is a thousand miles away. But God is in that non-response. Says the second key. Look with your heart. Look to Him first. Secondly, look beyond God's apparent non-response. Persevere through. Here's the third thing. When you look with your heart, look to do whatever He tells you. Because as you look beyond God's non-response in the situation, He will speak to you. He will tell you. 
I remember many years ago, we were holding uh, an evening to pray for healing. And uh, we started, we, a miracle broke out in an incredible way. Because in our congregation, we had a woman uh, who was pregnant. And when she was pregnant, she fell and slipped and fell and cracked her tailbone. And she was in severe pain, so that they had to do a C-section for her and deliver the baby. Uh, but she couldn't walk for many weeks after delivering the baby and nursed the baby in the bed. Eventually, she could struggle up walking in severe pain. But she didn't come to church for two months because she could hardly walk because of the cracked tailbone. Then one day she heard that we were having a healing evening service. So she told her husband, you know what, just, just drop me outside the, the, the hotel lobby uh, and I will make my way to church. The husband said, you're crazy. He said, she, I, I know, he says, no, God has told me I must go for this healing service. You know, um, Skyline Church, we are actually in a, in a five-star hotel. Pastor Diona and Pastor Ta uh, Peter have been to us before and they, they know that we're in this beautiful five-star hotel resort. We're on the third floor and you need to get uh, onto a spiral staircase, a grand spiral staircase to walk up to where we are as a church. And this woman, she struggled up the spiral staircase. She left her baby at home to be looked after by her husband. She struggled up the staircase. And I was speaking in that service that evening. She appeared at the back door and I was shocked that she had come to church. And then, you know, when we prayed for the sick, she came, she struggled forward. And as we, we prayed for her, she fell onto the floor and I was so shocked that she might crack another bone. I asked my, my, one of my pastors to pick her up very quickly. And she, but she, she shooed them all away and she stood up before me and she said, I'm healed. The pain is gone. You see, I can walk. And she walked normally. And she, she said, I can run. And she started running around the auditorium. You know, faith erupted. And God just broke through in a mighty way. Miracles break through. How many of you want miracles like that in your lives? Because we worship a supernatural God. Miracles are part and parcel of what God wants us to inherit in our discipleship journey. Because He's a supernatural God. He's a God who is a miracle worker even as we journey with Jesus. Here's the fourth key. Not only do we look to obey what He says, we need not just to obey, but we need to step out. Everybody say step out. Step out in faith and receive. Look to step out in faith and to receive. Now, it's so important because, uh, you know, when, when, when Jesus said to, to Mary, uh, you know, tell the people to fill up the jars, the six stone jars of water, now, it's not easy to fill up six stone jars of water, each containing 30 gallons of water. It's not easy. They had no running water that day. They probably had to go down to the well, you know, take small pots of water, come up and then fill it up again and fill it to the brim. Lots of servants, lots of hard work. But they stepped out to obey what Jesus had said. We sometimes need to go through tough times to obey what God has said in the midst of that, in challenges. Sometimes it's outside our comfort zone, but step out by faith. And then Jesus said uh, to, the, to, to, to the servants, now you take the water and serve it to the master of the house, the master of the feast. And they took that water, probably in a small, put some water in a smaller pot and took it to the master of the feast. Now, scripture suggests to us that somewhere in that journey, as they were walking from where the pots were to into the house where the master of the feast was and together where the, the bridal party and the wedding party was, the water changed into wine. We need to step out in faith and receive. And when they poured that water, that supposedly the water, it was actually wine coming into the cup of the, the master of the feast. And he probably tasted it and he said, wow, this is exciting. This is, this is fantastic stuff. Everybody serves the, 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 you know, the good wine first. Uh, and then when people are drunk, you serve the poor wine. But this is, you serve the best wine for the last. This is fantastic stuff. He probably tasted it and says, you know what, this reminds me of, mm, of Chateau Lafitte. 30 BC, that is, not 80. And you know, he was astounded. He was astounded by the miracles that took place. And I believe with these four keys, if we begin to look at our heart, look to him, look beyond the season of non-response, Look to obey what he says and look to step out in faith and obedience to him outside our comfort zone. We will see the miracles take place in our lives. Let me just tell you, what do miracles, people say, if miracles take place, you know, why is it that we hear so few reports about that? You know what? I'm a medical doctor. I've seen many miracles take place in my life. Um, you know what? And it's not reported in the papers in our town. 
Why, why is that? Why is it that it's not reported in Facebook or Instagram and the social media if there's so many miracles taking place? Well, I'll tell you the three reasons why. Firstly, when miracles take place, firstly, they are spectacular but often silent. What do I mean by that? Here it is. When water was poured out, it became wine. Chemically, H2O became C2H5OH. C2H5OH is alcohol. See? So H2O has no C. It has no carbon in it. Somewhere, carbon was created out of the hydrogen atoms, the H2, as water was being poured out into the, in, 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 into the, the cup, and it became wine. Now, it, it, what kind of miracle? It's, it's an amazing miracle because you cannot convert hydrogen to carbon atoms on planet Earth. You know where hydrogen is converted to carbon? It's in the middle of the sun, in the core of the sun at 5,000 degrees or above. Then hydrogen fused to form helium and helium fused to form carbon. It is a spectacular miracle. Yet, it was silent. Some of the most spectacular miracles that take place in our lives as we journey as disciples, it's hard to describe and tell people. If you tell people, you know, Jesus converted what changed water into wine, they'll laugh. See, many miracles are like that. They're, they're spectacular, but they're silent. When Jesus stilled the storm, who saw the miracle? Twelve disciples. Sometimes I wonder, Jesus, why didn't you still the storm and just get the whole of Galilee there, create the storm and then still it, then everybody will believe in you. I don't know why he didn't do it. But only 12 disciples saw the stilling of the storm. It's spectacular, but it's silent. That's the first reason why you don't read about it in your newspapers or read about it in your social media. Because when you tell it, something is missing. People don't believe it. Here's the second reason what, why. This is what miracles look like when they happen. They are often public but personal. They can happen in a public sphere, but they're sometimes very, very personal. They're very personal. Let me give an example. When Bartimaeus, the blind man, was healed outside the entrance of Jericho City, he had been there begging all his life. And when Jesus healed him, everybody saw it. Jesus was surrounded by the crowds. But as far as they were concerned, that was just... That was great. Good, good on you, Bartimaeus. You know, it's, it's great that, you know, it's nice to see a blind man getting healed. Well, let's move on to the city. As far as they were concerned, it was just a side show. You know, one of those shows that Jesus does in miracles and then move into the city, you know, and then eventually they're going to encounter Zacchaeus and then move into Jer Jericho, you know, for more things that Jesus do. And it was like one of the many incidences as far as the public is concerned. But for Bartimaeus, it's everything. It was life-changing for him, you know, He's no longer blind. He was begging on the streets. Now his life changes because he now can see. He can work for himself. He's no longer despised. Everything changed. It was public, but nobody can feel the miracle like him, personal. It's just like a woman with the issue of blood who had spent all the money on, on medical uh, uh, treatment and none of it had succeeded. 12 years, the issue of blood, and he touched the helm of Jesus' garment and, he was, and she was healed. And when she was healed, you know, as far as the crowd was concerned, she was just a nuisance. Who is this woman contaminating everybody and making everybody ritually unclean because she was bleeding? Who is this woman who was just holding Jesus back on his way to Jairus' house to heal his daughter? It was just, just somebody who was just, you know, just a nuisance on the way. And, and for the public, for the public saw this miracle take place when she, her bleeding stopped. And it was just like, okay, let's get on with the journey. Let's go to Jairus' house. So as the public was concerned. But for the woman with the issue of blood, it was everything. It was public, but very, very personal. And that's how I've experienced miracles in my own life. That's how I've experienced miracles and seen miracles and healings in, 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 in Skyline and in the life as a disciple and even in my medical clinic in praying for the sick. I've seen this happen. Here's the third thing about the miracles of Jesus. Not only are they spectacular and silent and public, but personal, but they are abundant and abiding. They are abundant and yet abiding. You know, when Jesus converted all six jars into wine, of water into wine, that's 180 gallons. Each jar contained 30 gallons of water. So that is 180 gallons. That makes 680 liters of wine. That's almost... 1,000 bottles of wine. 
the equivalent that Jesus created. 900 over, just under 1,000 bottles of wine. Now, by my calculation, it is enough for anything from 2,700 to 5,600 guests, depending on how much each guest drink. In other words, a minimum of 2,700 guests. But you know, that's only a village wedding. Where would they have so many guests? 2,700 guests is royal wedding size. When Queen Elizabeth got married in 1947, at her royal wedding, she had 2,500 guests. That's royal wedding. Jesus made enough wine for over 2,700 to 5,000 over guests. It is not just abundant, but it is abiding. The household had more than enough wine to last them years. That's the kind of God we worship. He's the God of abundance. When He blesses you, when the miracles come through, it is the God of the more than. I want you to know that. And that's been my experience. Let me close. I share with you the story. It's very personal to my own family because I have three children. I have three children. And the youngest, uh, is, her name is Sarah. At the age of four, Sarah, my youngest daughter, was found accidentally strangulated on a clothesline at the backyard of the violin teacher's house. Now, we don't know what happened. We know that it was a clothesline with a loose piece of string with a noose uh, hanging down. And she was playing with another three-year-old girl, climbing on stools, playing with this rope, and nobody saw them. And eventually, she got her head and her neck caught in that rope. And then it accidentally must have kicked the stool and then strangulated. She was only found about eight minutes, seven, eight minutes later. When she was brought down, she was dead. And uh, there was no pulse, no respiration. The pupils were fixed and dilated in the four o'clock afternoon sun. And the violin teacher was screaming and trying to do CPR the best she could. I, they rang me frantically. I managed to get there in time. And, and the Lord said to me, you just go and speak life into Sarah. So when I arrived, I got there even before the ambulance. I spoke life into her before I pulled out my medical tools. God brought breath back into her life. But she was in a deep coma with all the signs of major brain damage. We brought her to hospital and she was in a coma. And she was in a coma overnight, you know, in, in high dependency, in, in the intensive care. But, you know, 12 hours after she went to hospital, the whole church came together to pray through the night. 12 hours after that, she woke up the, the next morning suddenly completely healed. And this is Sarah, completely healed. With her mom, Nancy, my wife, and her elder sister, Frances. And this is her at four years old, waking up completely healed without any sign of brain damage at all. When God does something, it is not just abundant, it is also abiding. Because people often ask, what is Sarah like today? Because that happened 18 years ago when she was four years old. Sarah is 22 years old today. What's she like? Does she have all the residue of brain damage? Was there any brain damage from that incident? God brought her back? No. Sarah has just graduated from medical school. When God does something, it is not just abundant, it is abiding. And I believe we worship the God more than, He will do more than exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you can ask or think. This is Sarah today at 22 years old with her brother, her older brother, okay, and, and her older sister. And we have, we have three kids. And this is what God does in this amazing uh, time. I believe that God wants to do a miracle after miracle in this year of 2021. I believe that as God shapes our character, I believe that if we step out of our comfort zone and, and, and share the gospel that we, and, and, and make disciples of nations as the gospel mandate is given to us, I believe that part and parcel of the new normal in disciple making that God's going to give us in this year 2021 will include breakthroughs and miracles. We're going to see miracles. We're going to go see breakthroughs. We're going to go through challenges and we're going to see the hand of God come through for our lives. How do we begin to receive the miraculous in our lives? Here's the thing. Believe God's word. Believe what he says. Understand the word of God. But now by faith, believe in your heart. Look to him first with your heart. Look beyond his non-response. Look to hear what he says to you. And look to step out of your comfort zone by faith. And you will see those miracles take place. And when they do, they're often spectacular, but silent. They may be in public places, but they're very personal to you. And when they happen, they're abundant and abiding. If that's you, and if you believe that that's what you want from God, and you believe that you want to walk the supernatural journey as a disciple of the Lord, 
I want to pray for you. I want you to lift up your hands where you are right now and open your hands right now like this in this way because I want to pray for you and I want to pray for fresh faith and impartation of faith upon your life. I pray that in, in CCF, that in this year of the new normal discipleship, it will be a year of also miraculous breakthroughs for your lives as a church and for many of you in your lives, in your family. Are you ready now? Just lift up your hand as I pray for you. Father God, I just thank you for each and every one here today. I thank you, Lord, that when you did that miracle at Cana of Galilee, Lord, it had all these things, but the people who saw it, the people who believed were the disciples. They saw. You know, I pray that today as your disciples, Lord, we will be expectant of miracles in our lives. And I pray that the year 2021 will be a supernatural year because God, you are the way maker. You are the miracle worker. You are the light in our darkness. And I pray for each one, whatever we are going through right now, challenges in our business, our families, our health, our personal lives, our work, and other challenges that only you know, but God knows. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will learn to believe God at his word. Believe that you worship a supernatural God of miracles. And I believe by God's grace, as I speak about faith and I impart faith into your life, that you will rise up in faith to believe God at his word and that you will look to Jesus and that miracles will begin to take place right throughout this year. Even as you begin to share the gospel, even as you obey the great commission to make disciples of all nations. May you grow from grace to grace, strength to strength, faith to faith, that you may see God's glory from glory to glory. I bless you and I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Miracles. They are extraordinary events where God intervenes in the life of a person. Something that, that they couldn't understand or they couldn't explain uh, by human standards or even by scientific means. And one of the greatest miracles ever will, uh, will for someone will be the experience of having a changed heart in a transformed life when that person surrenders his uh, life to God. When an unworthy person becomes worthy, not because of what he has done or not because of, of his doing, but because of the blood and the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we celebrate in the Lord's table. We remember his death and his resurrection as the, um, as the bread that symbolizes or represents his body and as the cup of wine uh, symbolizes his blood. We don't take this um, communion lightly. We come to the table reflecting on our sin that Jesus Christ paid on the cross for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, it says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. We know that there is not one person in the world who was worthy of the Lord Jesus. I'm not worthy, you're not worthy, and we, we are not worthy. That's why Jesus died for us. When Paul talks about being unworthy here, he means to partake of the bread and of the cup in an empty manner. It is to participate in the Lord's table and not being uh, unforgiving. It is to participate in the Lord's table and not having your mind wander off, you know, many miles away or, or your mind just drifting or daydreaming. It is to participate in the Lord's table and not having any unconfessed sin in your life. When you come to the Lord's table, God wants us to be transparent. He wants us to be open and honest to Him. Before you participate in the Lord's table, the Lord wants you and me to examine ourselves of sin and confess it. You see, there are only two requirements for taking communion. First, you must know Jesus Christ 
as your Lord and Savior. And second, you are to confess all known sins. and You are to be transparent and open to Him. You have to be honest with Him about your failures or sins as a Christian. Examine yourself if you're worthy. There is a, a, a man named Antonio who lived in the 17th century. He was a violin maker. He did not make violins from very valuable wood. In fact, um, when he carved violins, he would get lumber that's, that's, uh, that's been thrown out, that's been thrown away. Um, he was a poor man and could not afford to get any kind of precious wood. So what he would do is this. He uh, would use anything that's available for him. He would go down to the waterfront or to the wharf. And there he would pick up dirty logs that had been immersed in the, in the water. It's been submerged in the water for quite a long time. They were slimy. They were dirty pieces of wood. And, and he would take them uh, home and take them to his shop. And it was discovered that while that wood was in those situations, the dirty water, little microbes went into the center of the wood and, and ate out the core of the wood. And because of that, all that was left of the, uh, the wood was this, this fibrous base or substructure. And from this wood, Antonio would produce violins that everyone wants even today. His first name, like I said, is Antonio. His last name is Stradivarius. From the trash wood, he created rare instruments of beauty and sound. I've told you this story to let you know that just as this man, Antonio Stradivarius, took trash and turn them into treasure. Jesus Christ is able to take us from sin and dirtiness and sliminess and, and make us beautiful. That's a great miracle. As you come to partake in the Lord's Supper, think of how beautiful you are in His sight because of His broken body and His shed blood. And if you have not surrendered your life to Jesus who paid for your sin, and have not received Him as your Lord and Savior, let me give you that opportunity right now. Let me lead you in a prayer. As you repeat those words after me, I'll, I'll give you the words if you can just supply your heart. You can just bow down your head and close your eyes and just say, God, I know I have sinned. I believe your son, Jesus Christ, died to take the punishment for my sin. I believe Jesus came back to life from death and has the power to forgive my sin and change my life. Forgive me. Come into my life and change me. I want to live for you. And I want to follow your plan for my life. I believe you, and I believe you have forgiven me. And I thank you for hearing my prayer in Jesus' name. If you have prayed that prayer sincerely in your heart, then you are eligible to partake of the Lord's Supper, and it will be really significant for you at this time. And right now, you may distribute your elements, the bread and the cup, to those who are with you, and I'll give you a minute to do just that, and then we'll pray. Let's bow down in prayer. Father, it was your son's body that was crucified on the cross. It was your son's body that was pierced. Instead of ours, Lord, it was His body. It was Your Son, Jesus, who died and satisfied the requirement of sin. 
Father, allow the Holy Spirit to make us aware of the magnitude of this sacrifice and how much you have done to forgive us our sins. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all partake of the bread, shall we? Now let's pray for the cup. Father, as our lips touch this cup, and as we sip and as we drink, we remember that His life was offered for us. His blood cleanses us of our sins. He was the Savior on the cross then. He is our Lord in life now. And He will be our advocate the day we cross over from this life to the next to meet Him. Or when the time comes, when He instantly comes for us, whichever is first, He will be there and He will remember our names. Thank you for that precious blood. In His name we pray. Amen. The Bible also continues in verse 25. It says, In the same way, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's all partake of the cup, shall we? And all of God's people said, Amen, Amen, and Amen.
the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and live forevermore yes Lord bless the Lord joining us. We hope and pray that this online service has been a source of blessing and encouragement. If you have any questions, comments, or if there's any way that we can pray for you, please get in touch with us on the links below. There will be discussion questions to help you process the message even more. Gather around with your friends and or families or use this quiet time with God. May your faith continue to grow. Friends, if you have made the decision to follow Christ today, we would love to hear your story. Drop us a note and we are always ready to guide you on your newfound faith. Also, one part of our worship is our tithes and offering, and we would like to give you the opportunity to worship God in giving. You can certainly and securely do that through our links below. Lastly, there will be Children's Church happening today at 2.30 p.m. So, in behalf of Christ Commission Fellowship in San Francisco, my name is Bev Concepcion. Make prayer your first priority instead of last resort. Have a joyful week ahead!